Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Yes. Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence this morning. Thank you. Thank you for joining me this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Geraldine. Thank you. And I want to welcome the family this morning. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to Journey into the Word Ministry. And as we, good morning, Barbara. And as we're listening to the music this morning, welcome, Holy Spirit. Uh, be sure to read the notes and our information for the ministry that's being placed here uh, on our Facebook page. We want to stay connected with you. We don't want this to be a one time thing or a every now and then thing or periodically we'll come back and see them. Good morning, Georgia. Yes, we, um, we want you to stay connected with us and we want you to come. And join us every Saturday morning. Hi, Ethelia. Uh, Diaz, good to see you this morning. If you are here for the first time, good morning, Wanda. My cheerleader's back. Good morning. Um, I want to welcome those of you who are here for the first time and have never been on here before. We welcome you. Uh, we are a family of love, and we love you. We, we, um, we embrace you. Uh, people from all over the world here on this ministry page. We are not a membership or a denomination. We are a witnesses and we're an evangelistical uh, evangelism, ministry of evangelism and non-denominational. So we welcome you here. We believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, Juliana. I'm so happy to see the many of you. Colleen, good morning from Mexico. So, uh, New Mexico. So thank you, um, those who are watching. And if you're here for the first time, please, good morning, Victor from Nairobi. If you're here for the first time, please let us know where you're, where you're from, what nation, what country, what city, state you're from, if you're here for the first time, so that we can welcome you properly. Um, but we do thank you. We thank you. Um, good morning. Good morning. Ethelia, you can tell us where you're from, if this is your first time. Um, and those of you, if you hear someone say, welcome, family, uh, that means that um, we are welcoming you into the family. So, uh, not a church building, but we welcome you into the family. So don't, you know, don't say, well, oh, is this a family ministry? Yes, we are family ministry of all nations, all people, all culture. And we thank you for joining us. We, I want you to share the word. Good morning, Phyllis. I'm happy to see you on this morning. Um, I want you to share with others who are joining us this morning. Um, share so they can get the word of God. Um, I'm so happy. It's, it's really great when you can come. And know that your family is going to meet you at the table. <laughs> it's a blessing to know that your family uh, will meet you at the table for a spiritual feeding. And I'm not talking about biological family. Uh, it's like the family of Jesus Christ. We are family of Jesus Christ. Good morning, Ali Manuel. Good morning. Thank you for joining this morning. And once again, uh, let us know where you're from uh, so that we can welcome you from uh, your country, your nation, your city, your state. Uh, I'm J.P. Olson with Journey into the Word Ministry, and we welcome you here this morning. As you love, yes, it's very peaceful one. It's very peaceful here, and uh, I put my cat and my dog outside so they wouldn't disturb me this morning as well. <laughs> so, um, but we want to we want to get into the Word of God, um, and we welcome in the Holy Spirit presence. So, I thank you again this morning for joining me here. Uh, you're from the Philippines. All right, thank you. Ethelia is from the Philippines, and Lee is from Ghana. We welcome you here this morning um, and to the family, uh, Journey to the Word Ministry. So thank you again for joining, and you can all definitely share with others um, the Word of God. And so now it's 9.05, and so I want to get into the Word, and uh, but we want to come in properly. We want to just usher in the presence of the Holy Spirit into our uh, gatherings on Saturday mornings. So we're going to go into the Word of God. I thank you again, those of you who have joined me this morning. And uh, for I know you could be doing something else on Saturday morning, but you're here listening to JP. And so I'm so happy. This uh, We do a spiritual feeding. Uh, so as we, uh, hi, Yeboah. I thank Yeboah Samuel. Good morning. Uh, once again, those of you here for the first time, please let us know where you're from. And family, welcome them in uh, for joining us this morning. We have people from all over uh, New York and um uh, Nairobi, Kenya, and the Philippines, and Mexico, and, and uh, Wisconsin, and Tennessee, and, and Georgia, 
and uh, uh, Illinois, Florida, the different ones. I'm seeing New Zealand, Australia. Some I'm seeing that you may, you all are not able to see on, but I thank you all for joining me this morning. So let's just hop right in. We're going to begin the day in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this new day. Your mercies are new every day, Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. Holy Spirit, I humbly ask you by faith to wash over our minds, our hearts, and our souls, and our bodies with your supernatural cleansing and healing present. A good, may you guide and lead every step we take and every word we speak today. Lord, guide us. Father, it's a new season. So help us to move in this season without looking back. We can't use the same tools and, and expect optimal results. We're listening for your instructions, Lord, to move with power and authority. Uh, busyness is one of the devil's most successful weapons in preventing Christians from spending time in the word and prayer. And many have fallen prey to this demonic tactic more times than they would love to admit. Each day may we choose to prioritize the things of the Lord. Father, your timing is perfect. We may not always feel that way as we impatiently wait on you to answer our prayers, but we must trust that move of your hand, Lord. Help us to persevere and endure beyond what our eyes can see. When we bring our tired and our weary souls to you, we can be strengthened, Lord, with your might. That might is power to get beyond any situation or circumstance that we would speak defeat, Lord. We dwell in the righteousness of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Uh, good morning. I saw, I think, Angie on and Janet. I uh, don't know where you, but you're from, J Janet, but please put on where you're uh, visiting us from. Good morning, Juliana. Uh, we're going to thank you, Juliana. We're going to pray for the, we want to include that pray for the people in Haiti. Uh, we're praying for them, that nation. Uh, those of you who have been on the past few weeks know that we have talked about the nation of Haiti and what is going on, on there, Lord, we, we, we pray for peace. But my prayer specifically, specifically for Haiti, is that God will raise up a righteous leader who fears him. Yes, yes. Thank you, Janet, from Florida. Thank you, vis visiting from Florida. Thank you. Um, we pray for Haiti, that God raise up a righteous leader who fears him and that will turn the country around. And that their God is our God, the God we worship of heaven and earth. Uh, not Satan, not voodoo, none of that. We pray because there, there will, that's the only time it will be peace. It's when they worship the true and living God. And so that's what we pray for Haiti, that people come together, Lord, stop the violence, Father, but raise up a leader, Lord, you can do it. We know that you can. And that's our prayer that the fighting, that peace will come, that Jehovah Shalom will reign over the nations. Uh, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. So thank you again for those who... Um, visiting for the first time uh, from uh, uh, Ghana, from uh, Philippines, from Florida. Uh, those who may be visiting for the first time, we welcome you to the family and to the gathering this morning. And we pray that you invite others. And we're here every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. Welcome. Welcome, family. Come to the table so that we can partake of the word of God. And that's the spiritual meal that I will be serving this morning. The table is spread and there's a feast going on over here. Now, as I mentioned, we want to stay connected. We have several ways to do that. If you have to leave here a little early, I want to just get this out. Social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Bible study we have is each Monday with Sheree Wells, the host and the teacher. I tell you, it's nothing like getting fed the Word of God in Bible study. Not just any Bible study, but we need to get into a Bible study. Uh, so that we can understand the Word of God with understanding and clarity. Uh, our numbers listed here in the comment box. We have our motivational and inspirational readings are scheduled to go out each Monday. Good morning, Wilmers. Each Monday, uh, so that that's to inspire you and to motivate you to get through the week. And so be sure to sign up to receive these readings each Monday. Your emails, we have our email address listed. You can email me if you want to receive those. We have the information listed here as well. I am back here every Wednesday, every Wednesday on my Just Passing Through segment with words of encouragement to help you get through the week on a positive word of encouragement at 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. That's Chicago time. Yes, good morning, Celine from Georgia. So I'm on for 30 minutes on Wednesdays. Please come and join me. Send us a prayer request. Uh, you can send that to our email right now. Send it to our email and uh, visit our, we, we're going to, we, we're working on it. I was praying so, Lord, let this website be up to date, but God has his time. But I want you to know that 
we have the website and, and it will be up. We, we had to do some maintenance, had to go regroup on it, but you'll be able to come back. You'll be able to visit it. You'll be able to go to the site. So just stay with us here, but we're going to give you ways to stay connected. So you can do it via the email and we're going to talk about that. So complete your prayer request form and send it to us. And lastly, lastly, we pray that you would consider giving into our ministry. Luke 6 38 said new living translation, give and you will receive your gift will return to you and hold press down, shaken together, make room for more running over and poured into your lap. And those of you, I thank those of you who have made a commitment, but those of you who have made a commitment and sort of slacked off and stopped, continue to give. Continue to give and watch God bless you. This has been one of our tough, difficult months financially to help uh, the projects that we're doing and help the people that need help. This has been a difficult month financially for us. So we're asking you to give and bless someone else and, and, and re, uh, re, 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 uh, do your vow and come back in and start giving again like you were giving before those who made a commitment and, and sort of slacked off. We, we don't want to slack off giving God his. It's not for me. It's for what we can do. Okay. And so there we go. God, God will bless you abundantly so that all things always having all that you need, you will abound in every good work up again and bring forth a significant increase so that he will multiply the seed of goodwill. So now I'm going to, I sent out um, a message inviting people to join this morning. And that word that I sent out is not my message. I don't want you to get confused. I want you to stay on here. But it's a word that God gave me as I was trying to type and finish my message. The word kept coming back to me. And I know this word is for someone and so I'm going to give you the word and then I'm going to get into the message. And those of you joining me for the first time, my messages may be a little different because they're messages that speak on how God is preparing us for the return of his son. And today I'm going to get a little deep and maybe a little uncomfortable. That's okay. We're going to go there. We're going to go there and touch on some, uh, some, some words and what, what Jesus want us to do. We're going to do that today. But let nothing that happens today or has happened before discourage you about tomorrow. Our words create and tear down things. Pray that your words today will honor God and that the things you say might cooperate with what God wants to accomplish in you. God's plan for your life far exceed the circumstances of your day. Let God's promises shine on your problems. Let God's promises shine on your problems because his plan for your life far exceeds the circumstances of your day. So going into the word that God gave me this morning. And if I, if I miss someone this morning, I pray that I call each person's name and I welcome you here again. While trying to re uh, write my message this morning, the Holy Spirit continues to give me these words. And family, this sort of really literally, literally gave me chills. The word of God said, we have to go back to what God said. In every situation, no matter what we see, no matter what Satan is threatening, what did God say? He has spoken and his word is alive. Stand on it, release it, fight it, and win with it. God is bringing you full circle. He's bringing you full circle this morning. Something is about to come full circle in your life. Your faith is putting you in a position to see uncommon things, receive uncommon things, achieve uncommon things, in a highly uncommon short time, you will look around at your situation and you'll look around in awe and you will say, God did this. God did this. So it is no coincidence that you're listening to this this morning because God makes sure that we hear or see the right things at the right time. And today, the Lord wants you to know he's not finished in your life. Don't think where you are is where you'll stay or all you'll ever have greater is coming, says the Lord. I'm not on here every week speaking a prophetic word or word. Everyone knows who knows me. Cover. I come and teach and preach and whatever God has me to do. But this word kept coming to me. And God, it says something that seemed like a closed door or defeat is a redirection by the hand of God and will lead to greater victory. Please don't think that you know the way things will go. Please. Some parts of your destiny are kept secret until it's time. So I continue to hear this. God is bringing you full circle. Something is about to come full circle in your life, a journey, a path, a battle, a pursuit, a plan, a vision, a dream, a relationship, your destiny, your victory, your calling. 
God's plan full circle in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Yes, that's the word of God. That's the word that God gave and wanted me to share. God said, no matter, we have to go back to what God said. In every situation, no matter what we see, stop looking at what you see in front of you. No matter what Satan is threatening, what did God say? He has spoken and his word is alive. So we want you to stand on it. We want you to release it. We want you to fight and win it because God is bringing you full circle. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And we're going to, I'm going to now jump into this message and hope that I can get it finished all. And, this, and now I'm getting ready to take you in a different direction. I'm getting ready to shift now, but I had to give you that word of God. Psalm 42, one and three says a white tailed deer drinks from the Creek. I want to drink God, deep thoughts and deep draughts of God. I'm thirsty for God alive. I wonder, will I ever make it arrive and drink in God's presence? I'm on a diet of tears, tears for breakfast, tears for supper, all for supper, all day long. People knock at my door, pestering. Where is this God of yours? That's from David. Thank you for the hearts. You all know I love the hearts and the likes. You know, after about a week and I have a story. Those of you maybe for the first time, I'm always sharing a little story to jump into where I'm jump into my message. But just stay with me. You know, after about a week of rain and we've been having some rains here where I am in Wisconsin, you start to forget what the sun looks like. And we experienced something just like that a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, uh, and some may have experienced a, a few seasons ago uh, that we had not, no other choice but to endure the rain. Uh, God controls all the elements of the earth, so we're fine. Rain, sleet, snow, whatever it may be. But it, but meant, <clears throat> it meant to go to the point where you didn't have to listen for the weather forecast any longer because you knew it was going to rain. That's how often it was raining. And I think that just gave us like a duh, it's going to rain today. It's going to rain today. On a repeat tape, we were saying that. So after consistent rain forecast day after day, you simply knew what it was going to be like the next day, okay? Well, I glanced at this stretch of hotels that was along the road as I was driving the other day, on the way home. And what to my wondering, I should appear but sprinklers. People had sprinklers on the yard. Here it is, raining outside, flooding, so your, your yard is saturated, okay? I'm going somewhere with this. But sprinklers, yeah, all their lawn sprinklers was out and going full blast. Watering is not a thirsty, they were watering a not so thirsty lawn because the lawn had been saturated with rain. I couldn't believe it. After a week of torrential rain and on a day when the rain was still pouring down, these companies had the sprinklers on full blast. In essence, they were saturating what was already saturated. So according to the powerful word of God, Jesus overhearing, he shouted back, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Go figure out what the scripture means. I'm after mercy, not religion. I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. This is from Matthew 9, 12 in the messenger. In other words, I came as the living water, he said, for those who are spiritually and eternally dying of thirst, not those who already have a well of water bubbling up on the inside. There's no need to water a lawn that's already drowning in water when there is a better use of the water, to water what's dry and dying of thirst. We're in a dehydrated world today, if you haven't noticed. You know, these days, you don't have to go very far to find the places where Christ is not known. The dry places, the unrained on places, the unwatered places, the unsaturated places. I mean, our society has basically been divided like a river over recent years. On one side of that river are Christians who've gotten more Christian stuff than Christians have ever had. Christian TV and radio and internet and books and blogs and seminars and magazines and concerts. There's so much going on spiritually. In a way, we're the most spiritually saturated believers in all of history. But now far across the river on the other side, on the opposite side, are people who don't know Christ. Which is honestly, is the majority of people around us. There have probably never been so many lost people in this country who have known so little about Jesus as people today. Who have cared so little about the Bible who's lived so totally oblivious to God. In a sense, they are dying of spiritual thirst. The Bible says, Jesus answered her, all who drink of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever takes a drink of the water that I will give him shall never, no, never thirst again. Be thirsty anymore, he said. But the water that I will give him shall become a spring of water welling up, flowing and bubbling continually within him unto him. For eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never get thirsty again. That's in John 4, 13 and 15 in the Amplified Bible. 
So the people with the water and the people with the thirst, how unfortunately they have been farther apart. They have unfortunately never been so far apart than now. And what I love about the text in John is the woman is not resistant, but ready to receive. See, when we're willing and ready to receive that water that will never run dry. How many people are around us today ready to receive Jesus, the living water, yet our sprinklers are turned on on Sunday only to saturate the already saturated as others die of thirst? I often say if only the people you know associate with are Christians, then you have a problem. You have a problem. We are all God's harvest hands. And if anyone is a believer and that's the only group of people you feel comfortable around, then, then the problem is more serious because Jesus was a people person. He didn't have just believers around him. He was a people person. Even when he brought his disciples with him, they weren't believers. He brought them with him and said, follow me. So if those are the only people you associate with, you have a problem. Because we're God's harvest hand. He was a people person. You have to feel comfortable. Jesus, when he walked the earth in human form, he visited places where people were lost. Although he had his disciples, I called his posse, they went to places to teach and preach the gospel and the good news. And then Jesus would say, follow me. He did not say, come join the church. Do you want to become a member? He didn't say that. He said, follow me. Wherever he went, people were running to see who this man was. Some because they knew he was going to feed them. But he did not want them to come for the physical, natural food, but for the spiritual feeding. Because this is what they lacked. As so many today, they were hungry for the living bread and thirsty for the living water from a well that would never run dry. And did not even know it until Jesus started teaching and sharing the word. They would listen. The world now is hungry and thirsty for the living bread. They are malnourished. The world is malnourished. They are dehydrated. My utmost prayer to God was to send me personally to nations where they had never heard of his son. And that's just what he did. He sent me to the farthest part of the earth, New Zealand, then Australia, and the list of countries multiplied. Those who know my history of my ministry. Um, really started over in uh, New Zealand and, uh, and there, Australia. And God just sent me to the nations what I prayed for. Because people here, they had too much. They didn't want to hear his word. And so he took me to Africa and different other nations and, and India and Haiti and, and, and just other places where people were hungry for the word and the living bread. But people here in America, has, they have too much. So we got too much, we're not hungry. Not that these countries did not know Jesus, but the unbelievers outweighed the believers. Some had never heard the name Jesus and wanted to know who this person was. Yes, we think that everybody knows Jesus. But you'll go to some place in some country and they're like, who is that? They never heard of him. Paul obviously here has a magnet inside of him that is drawing him to a particular people. It's pulling him toward a people who do not yet know his Christ. You see, he's not traveling from church to church to only preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to church folks. He's going where the people have not known nor heard of Jesus. These are the people who need to hear the message, which is why the Bible reads, but how can people call for help if they don't know who to trust? And how can they know who to trust if they haven't heard of the one who can be trusted? And how can they hear if nobody tells them? And how is anybody going to tell them unless someone is sent to do it? Romans 10, 14, 17. You see, we are the sent ones with a message to deliver to those who have yet to hear that our Jesus is still alive and is still saving. He's still healing. He's still delivering. He's still forgiving. He's still restoring and redeeming. We're spending far too much time feeding to the word to those who eat it daily already. We got to go outside. But what about those who have never heard a crumb from the master table? Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But how can we expect the people to live for God who are dying because of the church? They don't know to trust him unless we tell them. They don't know who to call for help unless we tell them. They will never hear unless we tell them. But the problem is, unfortunately, we're not only talking to those who already have heard and believe. We're only talking to those in the church on Sundays, in our prayer group, in our Bible studies. Paul continues to not only be called to people who don't know Jesus yet, but also the places where Christ is not yet known. The Bible says he told them, you don't get to know the time. Timing is the Father's business. What you'll get is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be able to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all over Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the world. 
That's in Acts 1 and 8. The disciples were sent as far as to the ends of the world with the message of Jesus Christ. And we can't get folks to go in their own neighborhoods. Listen, Jesus is not expecting us to hop on a plane and travel to every city, state, and country. But he does expect us to share the message where we can. Believe it or not, but there's people in the supermarket you, you, <laughs> that you go to that don't know your Jesus. When you dropped off your car at the mechanic, there are people there who don't know your Jesus. When you go to the doctor's office, there are people there who don't know your Jesus. When you go to work and spend some 8 to 12 hours daily, there are people there who don't know your Jesus. When you go to the gym and talk to everybody about everything except your Jesus, you do know that there are people there who don't know your Jesus. When you get in the cab, board the plane, hop on the bus or train, you do know that there are filled with people who don't know your Jesus. In the prisons, at the hospital, in the nursing homes, sitting at the dialysis center, laying in chemotherapy, struggling in rehab, waiting in line at the unemployment office, social services offices, the homeless shelter, the soup kitchen, in the mall, at the movies, in the deli, at the cleaners, are all places filled with people who do not yet know your Jesus. How then can you afford to be silent until Sunday in church with people who already know your Jesus? As I mentioned several times, you have people here come, come here from everywhere to the United States and they want to push all of their religions and everything on us. It's in the heart. And we're afraid to talk about our Jesus. Also, be careful not to lose yourself trying to find yourself in places God never intended you to be. Hint, lofty and high places, certainly it is not, okay? If you want to really find yourself, just locate the places your God has been. After all, you were made in his image and likeness. Remember, he dwells in humility. He hangs around the poor and the meek, not the cliques and the who's who. He lends a helping hand, and he lends a healing and a helping hand to those who are hurting and struggling. He is aiding the bound to become free. He is feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. He is providing shelter for the homeless and a protective hedge for those under attack. Believe it or not, the real heights are when you dab into the depths of despair to help someone who could not help themselves. I'm trying, Gazelle, I'm trying. Well, one reason that all the sprinklers are being aimed at the already, the already saturated. The word have been aimed at the folks sitting in the church, which is why our great commission was not to sit in the pews and pulpit, but it was to go to the people and places. There's a saying that, that Geraldine, a quote that she wrote, don't sit but serve. Jesus undeterred went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in, the, in this way of life, making them and marking them by baptism in the threefold name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. That's in Matthew 28, 19, 20. Thank you for the hearts this morning. I'm trying to deliver the message. Yes, God, you do realize that we are charged, commanded, and commissioned to go. It was not an idea. It was not negotiable. It was not a suggestion. We are charged, which is a demand. We are commanded, which is to be given an authoritative order. And we are commissioned, which is to be issued and entrusted to fulfill a duty. I'll say it again. It was not an idea. It was not a suggestion. It was not negotiable that we go. We are charged, which is a demand. We are commanded, which is to be given an authoritative order. And we are commissioned, which is to be issued and entrusted to fulfill a duty. Those, does any of that sound like do this if you feel like it? Do this when you feel like it. Do this if you should have a little spare time. No, this is go right now. Why? Because people's eternal lives are hanging in the balance. And if we reach them with the message of life, it will tip the scale in the favor of heaven on their behalf. I mean, do you really want someone to lift their eyes in hell because you were too focused on getting only you and yours into heaven? No, we are called to come back and to comfort, not to comfort. Let me get that right. We are called to come back and not to comfort. There's a thirsty and there are thirsty souls that are waiting for us to show up with the living water. Will we be present or absent is what we should ask ourselves. Most of us are familiar with the concept of urgency. It has to do with something that needs immediate attention because of its gravity. One of the challenging faith facing evangelical uh, Christianity is that we do not seem to feel it is urgent to reach people for Christ. This is by an explicit effort from Jesus to generate such urgency. Let me share something with him. It's going to be, this is a little deep. You know about the story. 
but it gets you to thinking it may make you feel a little uncomfortable because sometimes we don't even like to talk about even going into revelations. There was a rich man, you know the story, who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was, <coughs> was laid a beggar named Lazarus. Lazarus was covered with swords and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dolls came and licked his swords. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the finger, the tip of his finger in the water and come and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, good morning, Vanessa. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. That's in Luke 16, 19, 28. Either heaven or hell. When we die, we face either heaven or hell. While the great and final judgment was yet to come for both men in Jesus' story is clear that immediately upon our death, the fate of our lives is not only sealed, but the verdict of that, of that inevitable judgment is set in motion. The beggar Lazarus was by Abraham's side, which along with the concept of paradise is mentioned in the Talmud as the home of the righteous, the place where the righteous dead go to await their future redemption and vindication. The rich man was in hell in the original Greek word Hades the place where the wicked dead go. We do not often let our thoughts travel to such realities. It is uncomfortable, even chilling. But one person in Jesus' story had it enveloped every fiber of his being, the man in hell, to such a degree that he experienced a remarkable change in priorities. As I once heard someone observe, five minutes in hell made the rich man a flaming evangelist. Why? Because suddenly he knew it was all for real. This is a time of urgency. This is a time that we need to get the word to people who don't know Jesus Christ. And once he knew this, it mattered more. Once he knew this, nothing mattered more than warning those he cared about. Because he said, can you send someone to my home to tell my brothers so they won't come to this place? He knew that hell was not a figment of someone's imagination. It was real. And real people go there for eternity. And the man in hell knew that it would take someone going to tell his family, talking to them, making it clear to them. Hell has a way of making that clear. Meeting needs and realizing what precedes them. We must realize that our family, our friends, that person in our neighborhood, that person we work with who does not know Christ is in real trouble. We must not see the needs of the world solely in terms of food and clothing and justice and mercy and shelter and companionship. We must see those in needs to be sure and meet them, but we must see beyond them to the fallen nature of a world and humanity that produce those needs. We must see eternity waiting to be written in their hearts. And he's right, live with urgency, not passivity. It is difficult to imagine passivity regarding those who have yet to embrace the Christian faith or believe in Jesus Christ. The scriptures do not simply speak, they thunder, they roar. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Go into all the world, he said, and preach the good news to all creation. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save you. Does that sound, sound urgent to you? Passivity was not the model. Passivity was not the model of Jesus. He wasn't passive. He went into the world. He spent time with those who were far apart from God. He reached out relationally, build friendships. I always talk about developing a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ where you can talk to him about anything. He went into their homes. He attended their parties. He broke bread at their tables. Yes, he attended their parties, his first miracle in Cana, turning the water into wine. It was a party. It was a wedding celebration. His life was a life of urgency, and we are called to do the same. Listen, we can sit in the comfort of our Sunday school sessions, our Bible study lessons, our Christian websites and recordings, our videos, and drink it all in and feel like we're winning the battle. But the people we're next to every day are dying right in front of our eyes. All we've soaked up just drowns us unless we lay it on the line. 
take some risks and get involved with lost people where they are. Remember, we are harvest hands. Take some risks. Get involved like our Lord did. Indeed, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save people who are lost. That's in Luke 10, 19 and 10. What good does it do the kingdom for all those who have been found already? We are kingdom builders to only find themselves in church every Sunday while the lost wonders their way to hell all week long. Imagine you're at the mall with your son or daughter and they got lost and they get lost. How would that make you feel? I know as a parent, I would be scared, terrified, worried by my grandchildren telling somebody to help me find them. I would be calling 911, trying to locate the mall security officer so they can review the cameras, the doors, the stores. I would more than likely be in tears and praying and screaming out for them and God. A million thoughts would attack my mind. Did someone take them? Are they scared? Are they crying? Are they hurt? You know why all of this will be happening? Because they're my grandchildren and my children. I love them and I want them to be uh, always safe. That's the kind of unconditional love we need to have for the lost. Because truth is, many of them have no idea of the dangerous games the devil plays. They have no idea that their eternity is at stake. They may yell at people, you go on to hell. But they, do they really know what they, hell holds for them? No, they don't. Do they know that Satan is waiting for another notch on his belt? No, but we know. And we didn't escape his grasp because why? We're perfect and wounded and good. No, it was only by the grace and mercy that we got by and got out. I'm going to say it again. We can't walk around like we're so holy than thou, than thou. They don't understand that Satan is waiting for another notch on his belt. But we know that. And we didn't escape his grasp because we're perfect and wonderful and good and helping somebody and giving somebody something. It was only by grace and mercy that we got by and got out. Someone somewhere at some point in time told us about Jesus and saved our lives. Some of us know about the morning bench <laughs> when we go for a week hoping to hear God's voice. The old saints would say, did you hear anything? They were doing their best. <laughs> but, some, but we heard about him. We got out because someone somewhere at some point in time told us about Jesus and saved our lives. Somewhere in the Sunday school meetings that we went to. How can we not love the lost the same way and have saved their lives? Where are the Christians who were saved with Jesus and Paul are like, I'm here for lost people, not just to sit in my comfort zone among those who are already found. Where are the churches who would not just aim their resources at watering God's people, but who would risk their buildings and their reputations and even their budgets and lives to build a bridge to their lost community, not just to be a place to take care of the already rescued, but to be a life-saving station for their community. It's time to stop beautifying our buildings and take our fathers, our, take our beautiful feet to the homeless shelters and give them a makeover with the message of love from our Savior who has promised to beautify the meek with salvation. That's in Psalm 149 and 4. Instead of fish and chicken dinners to purchase a church van, why not take the dinners free of charge to the park bench where a man sleeps on an empty stomach because there's nowhere else to go? Instead of another uh, fashion show, why not a coat drive? Why not we have a coat drive? Instead of praising God for the healing that has taken place in your house of worship, why not take that testimony to the hospital and hospice where all hope has vanished that God can still heal? Instead of rejoicing over God curbing your shoe, shining, uh, shoe shopping fetish, I was in that number, why not take that deliverance testimony to the ones who have no strength left to continue the battle against their addictions? Today, let's move past the sprinklers. Let's receive from within our local assemblies and go out into the desert places where many are both naturally and spiritually dying. I'm telling you, the world is dehydrated. Let's supply natural food and quench spiritual thirst at the same time. After all, it's the expectation our Savior has for his sheep. We got to get bold. We got to become bold warriors. We got to be risk takers. We have to be so sold out that we don't care where we are. We can talk about Jesus. And even if somebody goes, shh, we shh them back. Because the world is lost. So many. When he finally arrives, listen to this. When he finally arrives, blazing in beauty and all his angels with him, the son of man will take his place on his righteous throne. Then all the nations will be arranged before him and he will sort the people out. Much as a shepherd sorts out sheep and goats, putting sheep to his right and goats to his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, enter, you who are blessed by my father. Take what's coming to you in this kingdom. It's been ready for you since the world's foundation. And here's why. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. 
I was homeless and you gave me a room. I was shivering and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you stopped the visit. I was in prison and you came to me. Then those sheep who are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and come to you? Then the king will say, I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you did one of these things that someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. Then he will turn to the goats, the ones on the left, and say, get out, worthless goats. You are good for nothing but the fires of hell. And why? Because I was hungry and you gave me no meal. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was homeless and you gave me no bed. I was shivering and you gave me no clothes. Sick and in prison and you never visited. Then those ghosts are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or homeless or shivering or sick or in prison and didn't help? And he will answer them, I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you fail to do one of these things to someone who was being overlooked or ignored, that was me. Then those ghosts will be herded to their eternal dream, but the sheep to their eternal reward. That's in Matthew in the Message Bible, 25, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. We are saturated ourselves long enough. Today, let's determine to leave from within the four walls of the church and saturate the dry places of a dying people in the four corners of the earth. In John 10, 16, I have, no other, I have other sheep that are not in the sheep pen. I must bring them together too when they hear my voice. Then there will be one flock of sheep and one shepherd. We got to go out and we got to help those. And we got to speak it when nobody else wants to hear it. Let them feel uncomfortable. So what? Let it be. They're uncomfortable because you're speaking about Jesus. They can talk about everybody else, of the, every other religion, every other of God that they're following or worshiping. But they want to hush us to talk about Jesus. Enough of drowning Christians in a thirsty world. Let's go find the rest of our shepherd's sheep and bring them into the safety of the family fold. John 3, 16, 18 said, this is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his only, one and only son, and therefore so that no one needs to be destroyed by believing in him. Anyone can have a whole and everlasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. No, he came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that per person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind son of God when in introduced to him. That's in the Message Bible of John 3, 16 and 18. Proverbs eleven thirty 30 said, The fruit of the consistently righteous is the tree of life. And he who is wise captures and wins souls for God. He gathers them for eternity. Acts 16, 46, 47. Some of us, many of us are part of the remnant. But Paul and Barnabas didn't back down. Standing their ground, they said it was required that God's word be spoken first to you, the Jews. But seeing that you want no part of it, you've made it quite clear that you have no taste of inclination for eternal life. The door is open to all the outsiders now. And we're on our way through it, following orders, doing what God commanded when he said, I've set you up as a light to all nations. You will proclaim salvation to the four winds and seven seas. 1 Corinthians 9 19, 23 said, Even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous, moralists, loose living immoralists, the defeated, the demonized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. We can't get so deep that we, I can't go down a memory lane. I can't go down... Um, uh, to the prison. I can't go there. That's not my kind of people. I can't. Nobody can see me there. That's what Jesus did. You have to come to. You have to come and, and, and view things from their point of view. That's what Paul did. You have to become one of them for the moment to get the word to them. You can't be so deep. I become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all this, he said, Paul said, because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. He wanted to be in on what they were talking about. To get them comfortable to talk about. It's not about comfort, but you got to get away. You can't go in like you're so deep. And then there are people, situations you have to walk away from. But God said, just go. Just go. Acts 3, 19, 23 said, now it's time. 
It's time to change your ways. Turn to face God so he can wipe away your sins and pour out showers of blessing to refresh you and send you the Messiah he's prepared for you, namely Jesus. He said, for the time being, he must remain out of sight in heaven until everything is restored to order again, just the way God, through the preaching of his holy prophets of old, said it would be. Moses, for instance, said, your God will raise up you for a prophet, just like me, from your family. Listen to every word he speaks to you. Every living soul who refuses to listen to that prophet will be wiped out from the people. You see, the mark of a great church is not its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. Matthew 9, 35, 38 said, Then Jesus made a circuit of all the towns and villages. He taught in their meeting places. He reported kingdom news and healed their diseased bodies. He healed their bruised and hurt lives. When he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. So confused and aimed as they were, like sheep with no shepherd. What's a huge harvest? He said to his disciples, How few workers on your knees and pray for harvest hands. That's in the Messenger Bible. And I hadn't even read about the harvest hands. I was calling harvest hand before I even read that in the message Bible. That's in Matthew 9, 35, 38. We look out around us and we look at our world. It's, it's dehydrated. It's thirsty. And some of them know and some don't know. They don't care. They're not interested in talking about Jesus. They're not even listening to him. We pray for our leaders in government that God will surround them with some godly men and women to speak into their lives. But they won't listen. Joby Martin said, if you're more concerned about politics and saving souls, then you may be a citizen of the wrong kingdom. And I'm going to repeat that again because somebody needs to hear that. Because some people are so, they, they say they're believers, they're so engulfed in politics. Yes, we need to know some things, but we also need to know how intimate relationship we have with Jesus Christ. If you're more concerned about politics and saving souls, then you may be a citizen of the wrong kingdom. Because it's nine times to save souls. At the end of the day, the biggest obstacle to evangelism is Christians who don't share the gospel because we're afraid to. Whatever we do, we must not treat the Great Commission like it's the great suggestion. It's not a suggestion. It's a commission. We are accomplishing the mission of Jesus through evangelism. This is what our ministry is doing. Evangelism is not so much about reminding people about how lost they are, but how loved they are by a loving Savior. We think about emergency vehicles demand access because human lives are at stake. Evangelism demands the same priority for the same reason because people's lives today are at stake. They're missing Jesus Christ. Every one of us has a pulpit to speak from. And I'm not saying a physical pulpit. A pulpit is your fear of influence, your platform. Use it and proclaim Jesus. We as Christians sometimes think we need a plan for evangelism. I don't think Jesus had an evangelism plan. I think he just interacted with the people he came in contact with. And that's what we're supposed to do. It's like Kirk Cameron said, if you had the cure to cancer, wouldn't you share it? You have the cure to death. Go out there and share it. The way you store up treasure in heaven is by investing in getting people there. And evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. We must be global Christians with a global vision because our God is a global God. And Charles Spurgeon said it like this, I would sooner bring one sinner to Jesus Christ and unravel all the mysteries of the divine world, for salvation is the one thing we are to live for. And evangelism is not a, jo a professional job for a few trained men, but is instead the unrelenting responsibility of every people who belongs to the company of Jesus. Evangelism is hard, but watching people you love go to hell is harder. Discipleship is a lifestyle filled with relationships, a life of pouring yourself out for others. Any method of evangelism will work if God is in it. And someone asked, will the, heathen, will the heathens who have never heard the gospel be saved? It is more a question with me whether we have the gospel and fail to give it to those who have not can be saved. I'm going to say that again. Someone asked, will, will the heathen who have never heard the gospel be saved? It is more a question with me whether we who have the gospel and fail to give it to those who have not can be saved. Because effective evangelism depends on faithful proclamation of the word. And God will prepare the soil and bring forth the fruit. We must be faithful to plant the seed. Every Christian is a missionary or an imposter, okay? One or the other. Our responsibility is to get God's word to their ears. Only God can get the words from their ears to their hearts. He said, 
Billy Graham said, I have never known a man who received Christ and never regretted it. You see, evangelism is not salesmanship. It is urging people and pressing them and coercing them and overwhelming them and subduing them. Evangelism is telling a message. Evangelism is reporting good news. That's why I say you don't have to beat brow someone or go in and, 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 and so deep in religiosity that you can't meet them where they are. We need to spend more time in study and prayer, and that's the secret of successful evangelism. And that's my message for today. It may have been a little deep, but sometimes we have to go deeper because it's a time of urgency. We got to start reaching people that we don't want to do. We don't want to do that. We are embarrassed. We're shamed. We, we, we fear. We don't know what they're going to say. But we need to be bold. We need to be bold. And as I come to the end, I don't want anyone to leave because I want people on here who may not have had a relationship with Jesus Christ, may not understand and may have needed this message. May have needed this message today. We have the prayer of salvation. I'm going to go over one more time before I get off. The word that God gave me today for some of you may have come late because it may have been a word for you. But the prayer, of salvation, the prayer of salvation says, so don't leave so you can hear the word that God gave me today and I'm going to share it. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you for those of seeking a relationship to be a part of the family of Jesus Christ and don't know him. In Hebrews 13 and 5, we cannot earn salvation. We are saved by God's grace when we have faith in his son. Jesus Christ, all you must do is believe you are a sinner, that Christ died for your sins and ask his forgiveness. Then turn from your sins, and that is called repentance. Jesus Christ knows you and loves you. What matters to him is the attitude of your heart, your honesty. Yes, you have to be bold, your honesty. Christ invites us to come to him, and God has promised to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. And Romans 10, 9 said in the Bible, you said, if we confess the Lord our God and believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, we shall be saved. And right now I confess Jesus as my Lord. You can say this today with me. I Right now, I confess Jesus as my Lord. And if you want to renew your vow today and you're on here today, you know you haven't been faithful as you should, being in the word of God, spending time, quality time. You can say, with my heart, I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And from this day forward, help me to live every day for you in a way that pleases you. This very moment, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. And according to his word right now, I am saved. God cannot abandon you. If you are here on here today, the fact that you have acknowledged you are struggling with sin is evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The world does not acknowledge sin. They indulge in it. Keep fighting the good fight and keep believing God has all power to break every chain. And then I want to share just one more time the word God gave me today. And if those of you, if you have to leave... I, I want you to consider giving. I really want you to consider giving. Um, I shared before that this was a tough month for us in helping others that need help. Um, in, our, in the word that God gave me today that I want to share one more time before we, we leave the air here, or leave the uh, Facebook, I think I'm on the radio. <laughs> um, while writing my message today, the Holy Spirit continued to give me these words. And this literally, as I shared earlier, gave me chills. We have to go back to what God said in every situation, no matter what we see, no matter what Satan is threatening, what did God say? He has spoken and his word is alive. Stand on it, receive it, release it, fight and win with it. Again, the Holy Spirit gave me these words. He said, we have to go back to what God said in every situation, no matter what we see, no matter what Satan is threatening, what did God say? He has spoken and his word is alive. Stand on it. Release it. Fight and win with it. God is bringing you full circle. Something is about to come full circle in your life. Your faith is putting you in position to see uncommon things. Receive uncommon things. Achieve uncommon things. In a highly uncommon short time. You will look around in awe and say God did this. And you will give him thanks. It's no coincidence that you're listening to this. Because God makes sure we hear or see the right things at the right time. Today, the Lord wants you to know he's not finishing your life. Don't think where you are is where you'll stay or you'll ever, you'll ever have it. This is all you'll ever have. Greater is coming, says the Lord. Something that seemed like a closed door, defeat is a redirection by the hand of God and will lead to greater victory. And please don't think you know the way things will go. Some parts of your destiny are kept secret until it's time. So I continue to hear this. All while I was trying to do my message, God is bringing you full circle. Something that's about to come full circle in your life. 
a journey, a path, a battle, a pursuit, a plan, a vision, a dream, a relationship, your destiny, your victory, your calling, God's plan, full circle in Jesus' name. And that's the word that he gave me this yesterday and, and, and last night continuously. So I wanted to make sure that I shared that with you because somebody is getting ready, life is getting ready to come full circle for you for those things that you've been waiting for. Uh, and you may know what it is. God knows. So I want to share, say to you, uh, the earlier, as I was saying, uh, giving. Uh, lastly, we just pray that you will consider giving us to the ministry. Luke 638, new, in the New Living Translation Bible, to give and you receive. Your gift will return to you in whole, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. Hearing nothing but blessing after blessing after people are praying and they're giving and they're sowing. God wants us to be a blessing to others. It's not for me. It's not coming to me. It goes out of our hand as soon as we get it to help others. We have five projects and we can barely get them. We got the farm in India together. Uh, we got the farm. We got the, the chicken. We got those things going. Uh, so we want to ask you to help us with the other projects that we have in Kenya, in, in Haiti, in, in, in Jamaica, in South Africa. I did have someone who committed to buy um, Gertrude a, a motor scooter so that she can go through the, the, the countryside, giving these letters out that God gave her to write to tell them about Jesus Christ. I tell you what a mighty God we serve. She's going across South Africa, walking, distributing letters that God put on her heart to write, to tell people to receive Jesus Christ as a Savior. And she's going there. And so someone called me and said, I'd get her a motor scooter and she can use that to go. So I tell you, whatever you can do to help, so into the kingdom, so into what we need. And I ask you in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God can bless you abundantly so that in all things always having all that you need, you will abound in every good work up again and bring forth a significant increase so that he will multiply the seed of goodwill. Also, I'm doing a fast. This is the second week going into the fasting. If you want to join me on the fast, Jordine has it listed. We can get your email address. We can post it on here so that you can join me in the fast. I'm going for 21 days, and this is going into the second week. I want you to join me on that fast. Uh, so we give you the information here so you can join me. If you're interested, just post in here that you want to join me on the fast. And we'll get you the information uh, in Messenger to your email address. And also, if you want to give, because we are working on the website and praying, Lord, let us have it up by next week for sure, you can send a check. I... Our P.O. box is listed on here. We have Zelle, and we have we did the cash app because somebody commented about the cash app. You can also go to PayPal and journey to the word ministry, journey to the word at gmail.com, and you can send through the PayPal. So if you want to do, if you want to give, and it's on your heart, you can do one or the other. Send a check to our P.O. box. Make that to journey to the word. You can go to journey to the word at gmail.com, PayPal. You can do Zelle. You can do cash app. You can do those things, uh, J.P. Olson, and we will... Make sure that we get everything in the hands and you will receive a letter. We're transparent about everything and we give a, send a letter to everybody that has given. You receive a regular letter of your gifts. And at the end of the year, if you want to claim those gifts, you can do that as well. So thank you again. God is good. I pray that you have enjoyed this, this message today. It's what God put on my heart. I only can give you what he put on my heart. I love each one of you. I love the hearts. I thank you. I pray that it's sometimes it's not a hooping, a jumping message. It's a message that we need to take in and hear because I'm telling you, we don't know when the Son of God is going to return, but not even the angels, but we know he's coming back. We want to help people. We want to make, we want to present Jesus Christ to them. We want to tell them about him. But then if you don't know about him, you need to go into the word and study about him. But we want to become bold uh, disciples and go out and tell people wherever we are in the car wash, in the grocery line, in the bank, at the at the uh, wherever we are, it could be at a funeral home, it could be uh, in the marketplace, in, wherever you are, you can tell someone about Jesus Christ and what He's done for your life and what is great to have in your life. So bless each one of you. I love each one of you. Thank you all. We have quite a few on here today for the first time. Family, welcome them. Uh, we please come back and join us on next uh, Saturday. Uh, thank you, Victor, from Nairobi, Kenya. We got so many that were on today from the Philippines, from Ghana, from Uganda, from New Zealand, from Australia, from New Mexico, and the various states we have, uh, the Philippines we have on here. So I want to thank you all. Bless you so much. Thank you, Janet, from Florida. I'm so happy. And tell others, and I'm here every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, every Wednesday at 1 o'clock. Uh, Central Standard Time, that's Chicago time. Thank you all for the hearts. I love you, and uh, I love each one of you. Thank you, Janet and Victor, and 
and I knew I was gonna, gonna, gonna miss some name here. I was trying to, well, anyways, you guys know who you are. You know that I love you, Wilma's and Celine and Georgia that was on from Tennessee and Leo from Ghana. LJ is on this morning. Good to see you, LJ, on. Um, again, Lee, and then Awanda is on. We have, um, just want to get some of the names that we have on here. Phyllis was on, and we had, I think, Barbara Ball was on. We had uh, Juliana on from New York. Uh, once again, Celine was on from Georgia. We have Ethella on, Diaz is on here this morning as well. I want to thank Geraldine for what she's doing. Uh, Phyllis was on this morning. Uh, Devon was on this morning. Gazelle was on this morning. Uh, Vanessa was on this morning from Georgia. So happy to have her here. Uh, so we have people from New York that's on. Um, and just the various ones that are on, I pray that if I, even if I miss you, uh, I'm so sorry. I want to make sure that I get all the names on. Wanda is on from Tennessee. One of my cheerleaders is on. So we thank you uh, this morning for you joining me. I'm just going to put on a song. It's 1001. So I'm just going to put on uh, Lord, I need you. That's what, because every message I pray, I teach, it's all about, Lord, we need you. So, and this is for those who don't know, <clears throat> this is on my CD. <clears throat> and you can get that um, on Amazon, um, iTunes, Spotify. Uh, you can order it. Um, also, you can go to my Facebook page and order it. Without you, Lord, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. And you can sing it with me. <laughs> Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you When sin runs deep When sin runs deep your grace is more Where grace is found It's where you are And where you are Lord, I am free Holiness Is Christ in me Lord, I need Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you To teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need you Oh I need you Every hour for I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. You're my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. You're my one Defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Thank you all so much, and yes, I need you. I need you. You are right. We need him every day and every hour. Thank you, God. Love you. I love you too. Until we meet again, if Jesus delay his coming, I will see you here on Wednesday at 1 o'clock p.m. or on